Welcome to Conservation Conversations, the podcast where we discuss emerging technologies, global trends, and the future of biodiversity conservation. I'm your host, Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe, where we leverage science and technology to protect endangered species and ecosystems around the world. I'm Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe, and I'm really excited today to be here with Razan Al-Mubarak, who is the President of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or IUCN. Um, Another acronym for everybody to remember, but it's a really important one because IUCN is one of the oldest environmental organizations and largest and one of the most important. And uh, you may not know it, but you've heard a lot about them probably because if you've ever heard of the Red List of Species or the Red List of Ecosystems, that's an IUCN uh, product and really important um, function that they provide to the world, talking about endangered species and, and habitats. And NatureServe is a partner with IUCN in working on these uh, red list assessments, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but Razan is a native of the United Arab Emirates and for more than 20 years has played a vital role in guiding her country toward a more sustainable future while spearheading progressive environmental protection and species conservation across West Asia. Um, and in 2001, she helped establish the Emirates Nature World Wildlife uh, Fund, an affiliate, affiliate of WWF. And she's engaged with several other conservation organizations. And then earlier this year, was elected president of IUCN, which is really exciting, I think, for all of us in the, in the field. Um, this is a critical moment in the world um, now. And I was gonna say in the world for conservation, but really just in the world. And we are facing so many challenges um, environmentally and IUCN is engaged in pretty much all of the key issues that are really threatening nature and threatening humanity. Um, so I just wanted to, I talked a little bit about what IUCN does, but it might be helpful for people to understand a little bit the bigger picture of what the IUCN is about. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you for having me on. I'm a big fan of NatureServe and thank you for NatureServe to really be a part of the IUCN network and, and its community. So exactly as you said it, I, uh, Sean, so IUCN is considered to be one of the oldest international environmental organization really dedicated to nature conservation. And what's really unique about it is that its membership brings both government and civil society with a short, shared goal to protect nature. So in that sense, that's what excites me the most about IUCN because it provides that platform for a wide array of discourses from the conservation field. And of course, its aim is to encourage uh, international cooperation and provide scientific knowledge and tools to guide conservation action. And as you said, we may all know the name, but um, we may not know the name, sorry, but we know its products. So we've, as you said, established the Red List, um, for some of your viewers or, you know, indeed hearers now, um, it's uh, the Red List is, is, has quite a history. I mean, it started in 1964, so it's been going on for some time. It's very well established. But what also um, some people may not know is that IUCN was at the advent of the frameworks that as conservationists today are a backbone of what we do. So, for example... Um, IUCN initiated the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, the World Heritage Convention, the Convention of International Trade and Endangered Species Societies, as well as the Convention on Biological Diversity. Let's see, um, what else? Um, IUCN is also one of the only permanent environmental uh, organization that serves on the uh, United Nations as a permanent observer. And in terms of scale, I, that always amazes me. So it's got um, more than 1,300 member organizations, of which NatureServe is proudly one of them, Indeed. Um, but represents more than 160 countries and has more than 18,000 international experts. So that makes the IUCN also not only the oldest, but the largest and most diverse environmental network. Yeah, that, uh, so as a side note, um, for a reminder for the listeners, uh, Tom Brooks was on the show uh, a few yeah. months ago. And uh, of course, he used to be the chief scientist at NatureServe. And now he's the uh, 
head of the IUCN Science and Knowledge Unit. And uh, so we're really excited to have that connection in addition to all of the other connections that our organizations have. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, Tom's, Tom's just a great guy, he's so fun. But um, so I'm really interested, you know, you're, you have this really long history in working in environmental causes. And uh, at some point you had to say to yourself, I need to do the IUCN presidency. I need to run for that because I have some things that I wanna do that go beyond the borders of the United Arab Emirates, that go beyond the borders of you know East Asia and the Middle Eastern area of the world. And uh, I'm, I'm really curious, like what was your, what spurred you to run for the presidency? And you know, what are your main objectives as president? So I think like all of us, I think we've gotten to a point where we are noticing everywhere um, in every part of the planet that nature destruction is happening at an unprecedented rate. So there's the, this, this stark reality that just wants to make you kind of scream and want to do, do things, um, but mainly yeah. to act. And I don't think, and I think we've gotten to a point where it's no longer just acceptable or only acceptable to do the things that we as conservation have traditionally done, which is describe a, a situation or collect data or assess. And I think we need to now combine this knowledge, this great knowledge that we've collected over you know, the, 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 the movement, the nature conservation movement, and really to act. And what drove me really to the IUCN family is I just felt that IUCN is really well positioned to leverage the breadth of its uh, members. You know, like I said before, what I love about um, IUCN is its modus operandi is leveling the playing field. It's the only institution or conservation organization that brings together both governments, civil society, in, uh, international or um, indigenous uh, people's organization, all on the same level. And the idea is that I felt that the IUCN, like I said, is, is really well placed um, to leverage um, this constituency and its expertise and tools to enable action, to really empower action on the ground everywhere. And it's this opportunity that I really seek the presidency of the, um, of, of the union. And I was uh, uh, very happily elected um, this September in Marseille at the World Conservation Congress. And again, for your listeners, um, that's another sort of a tool that the IUCN uses as a union to bring members, uh, those members every four years put together a vision for what conservation needs and requires um, and, and how a union can help empower its members to implement this vision. And so it's certainly um, um, really, really exciting. And the other thing, um, Sean, is, um, you know, we've noticed that just globally, there is this um, move to polar movement of polarization. And so um, me joining an institution like the IUCN that that has and carries an unwavering belief in the importance of cooperation and multilateralism is extremely important. So IUCN, again, for your listeners, was uh, established after the end of the Second World War. And it's um, with this new spirit of international cooperation at that time. And uh, this cooperation is exactly what is needed today to help protect nature, to help mitigate climate change. Um, we, uh, there's no doubt that we cannot conserve nature without international cooperation and without a global effort. And it's for those reasons and others, of course, um, you know, your show is not uh, um, as long so that I'm able to kind of describe all the other great reasons of joining the uh, IUCN, but it's for those prime, primarily um, I've, I've chosen to run for the presidency and, and very happy to be elected as president. So I, I was at the World Conservation Congress in Marseille and it was a fantastic experience. First of all, because for most of us, it was the first time we'd been in a crowd in two years. And so that was really amazing. Um, and the safety protocols meant that I don't, I'm not aware of uh, 
any outbreaks of disease that happened as a result of that. But it was also exciting because it was uh, where we had the election and a lot of other uh, important things that happened uh, at the at the meeting with you know uh, agreements and policies and things that were put forward. And so you know, one of the things that I think is so interesting about IUCN because of the scale and because of the position with the uh, um, the UN and all of these international agreements is you're at the table everywhere and you have the opportunity to influence what people are saying and doing and hopefully the the international policies that will come out of all of these agreements and i think that's so exciting because as you said iucn is so diverse and so you're mm -hmm. trying to incorporate an, an amazing number of perspectives you know truly 160 countries and the views of um indigenous people as well and it's it, it must be uh in some ways a little bit overwhelming to try and imagine yeah. uh, representing that um in the international community so overwhelming but incredibly profound like i said this is the moment where the world actually needs a platform to bring different discourses together and instead of just polarizing um those with different opinions and having to kind of just um, work against one another. Yeah. We need global cooperation now more than ever. And you know, you mentioned earlier one of your questions was, you know, what are the goals? What are what are my goals as president? And I have to say that they're very much aligned to what you were saying, and really, indeed, um, the members' goals. And 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 it, the context is as follows, right? So you've got biodiversity loss and climate change a dangerous tipping point eroding at our health, you know, you mentioned COVID, eroding at our security, our economy, and our very identity. And as such an institution like the IUCN, what the members want, what my goals uh, are, is to have a much stronger voice in global flora, uh, uh, sorry, flora. And, uh, and my, my goal really would be to help drive global political will to protect nature with a clear message that it will not cost us the planet to protect nature, um, but not acting will. Um, so we want to kind of present this message very clear and, 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 uh, and that takes me to my second goal, which is also to better communicate the importance of nature conservation. More often than not, climate change gets a larger presence in the environmental popular discourses. And so my goal is to ensure that nature conservation doesn't play second fiddle to climate change and is really recognized as an issue in its own uh, right. Um, we need to fundamentally recognize, you know, in our core, nature's contributions to humanity from the air that we breathe to the food that we eat and the climate that we depend on. And so again, um, my goal as president is to bring conservation into the mainstream narrative and um, if, if you will, de democratize it, make it accessible and make it inclusive. Um, for far too long, and, you know, and I'm guilty of this as a conservationist, um, we tend to speak to one another. Mm -hmm. um, rather than expand our, um, our, our, our discourse, our dialogue to other institutions in other disciplines. And so as president and working together closely with the members, we want to challenge this, um, this, this way of working and really um, extend our ideas, our, 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 our understanding of the world to other industries and, and, and really other perspectives. Because... I, it's only through this power of this multidisciplinary collaboration that I believe that innovation can be achieved. Because really, it's always in the intersection between science and art, between North and South, between the private and the public, that we can build perhaps a new narrative um, for and a new vision for nature conservation. I'm so, so excited. Big dream. Big um, yeah, it's a great um, dream. And I'm so excited that you're in this role. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's so fantastic. Because um, I couldn't agree with you more, obviously, coming from uh, an organization like NatureServe, but just also personally, um, climate change, of course, is 
crucial and critical and is affecting so many things. Um, but we we depend on biodiversity, right? Um, you know, as as uh, Healy Hamilton, our chief scientist, likes to say, every calorie that humans have ever eaten are from biodiversity, and we can't rely on you know the just the tiny number of species that we, we depend on now, but also all of the ecological infrastructure that you know cleans the water and cleans the air and produces oxygen, all of the um, nature's contributions to humanity that you were talking about it's all dependent on biodiversity. And so it's, it's so important and so great that you're taking that perspective. And one of the reasons we're talking right now is trying to expand the communication out to more people so that they'll understand this challenge. Absolutely. And just to kind of carry through with that thought, and we really need to kind of demonstrate, you know, the cost implication of that, because a lot of time when we're engaged on, um, you know, nature conservation, the types of programs, we, we, what we need to also show the world that it's not going to cost us, um, you know, the, the, the amount that perhaps people think that it would cost. And any investment in nature conservation has an incredible return. So if we invest, and there have been studies that show this, one dollar in nature conservation our return is $5 in nature services. So it's certainly something that we need to, I think, amplify um, the message that an investment in nature is not just uh, for us to, it's not an opportunity for us just to prevent a calamity, but really it's an opportunity for us for, uh, to, to develop growth, for prosperity, for job creation. And we need to make that, I think, message uh, much more clear. Yeah, it, it's... Um, in some ways, it's unfortunate that we have to make an economic argument to do the right thing by nature, right? There's there's moral reasons, there are aesthetic reasons, there's all sorts of reasons why we should be conserving biodiversity. Um, and because there's also economic and other reasons, it allows us to talk to all sorts of different people in different ways. And I think that's important because it's going to take everybody to to solve the biodiversity crisis. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so I wanted to ask you perhaps semi-personal questions. Um, and one is what what inspired you to basically dedicate your life to working on environmental issues? You've been doing this for 20 some years and um, it's now, <laughs> I think, 23 hours a day. You're working on IUCN related activities and trying to have a uh, get a little sleep and have a personal life in that other hour. Um, <laughs> and so I'm wondering what inspired you to get to this place? I, I think it's, um, you, know, if, you know, perhaps one is, they're both very selfish reasons, really. The first one was somebody, somebody very wise once said to me, um, do the things that make you happy. And, you know, so I thought about, you know, what is what are the things that do make me happy? And, and it's always nature has always been at the center of this answer. So always being out in nature is gave me this incredible energy, but also this almost meditative um, environment to to reflect on on what I want to do. Who am I? The big questions on the planet. But um, it's always been a place that that was very special for me personally. And then the other, so, so that was sort of an easy um, uh, answer to your question. It's what makes me happy. And therefore, I had the opportunity to study uh, environmental science at university and then continue working in, in, in this field. And so I was able to kind of, again, be extremely, um, I think, um, privileged to be able to combine something that I love and, 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 and earn a living from it. So right. that's, that's been great. But but quite specifically in, in the UAE, um, you know, I was uh, born in 1979, um, just a few years uh, after my country was established. So my country is quite young. It's, you know, it's only 50 years old. And um, and, you know, and what was very important for me culturally is I just felt that nature was a very strong part of this, the 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 tribal makeup of the United Arab Emirates. It's who we are. It's how our tribes were, were established. It's in our poetry, it's in our language, it's in our art. And I was seeing very quickly how, you know, 
un, unmanaged developments can eat away at nature. And this loss of nature will then eat away at a sense of identity. So I was uh, very alarmed by this and, and I wanted to uh, be part of a movement that helped you know, protect nature, but, but through the protection of nature was also preserving a, a culture and, and, an, and an identity. So it was a sort of a combination of, of seeing my country develop very quickly and seeing some of the most pristine areas being uh, developed and wanting to, to, to do something about it. And the other was just simply, like I said, this is something that make, made me happy. Right. And kind of moving, moving forward, I'm still inspired by nature. So that hasn't changed. Um, and I still believe that, you know, as we erode uh, um, from from you know the natural assets that we have, we are you know eating and eroding at our health, at our economy, at our identity, and um, and we need to globally make make uh, make do something about it. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. I completely agree with everything you just said, and I feel very similarly uh, about that. Um, I have the great privilege of. You know, working as you do with the nature organization, and so getting to go out into nature perhaps more often than some other people, and uh, it really is inspiring and amazing to see what happens out there and what, like, what evolution has created, and just you know the the very delicate balance that we're that we're affecting every day with development and climate change and all of the other um, impacts that humanity has on on nature. Uh, but I, I did want to also um, ask you a quick question about um, diversity of people in the environmental mm -hmm. movement. Um, mm -hmm. You're perhaps the highest ranking woman in the environmental world, environmental community. And uh, I'm interested in sort of your thoughts about, you know, why is it that in since the 1940s when IUCN was founded, you're only the second woman to uh, to lead the organization. And um, think about sort of also the, the ethnic and racial diversity in this field. And, uh, you know, in the United States, it's a little bit different than globally, because globally, of course, you've got 160 countries. So you've got great diversity uh, engaged in the IUCN. But oftentimes, you know, the environmental world or environmental community is seen as, um, you know, one group of people, you know, the United States and Europe sort of started and created a lot of the problems by developing early. And now mm -hmm. everyone else is sort of stuck with, you know, the on this path. And I don't know, I'm sort of asking two questions at the same time. And that is, you know, making us all feel like we're part of this and in countries like the United States trying to get us to pay attention and to do the right thing, but also to, um, you know, for countries that may not have the same resources that we have, get them engaged. And then as the separate, this other question, sort of thinking about um, uh, other kinds of human diversity in the, in the process. No, I mean, look, I mean, you, you've mentioned the number of key the themes, you know, you've mentioned many, the, sorry. the <laughs> No, but but it all it all comes it, it all comes together and it's all somehow integrated. So, you know, to have a truly successful movement like the environmental movement, you need all hands on deck, um, and you need different disciplines. I mean, the the environment is is complex. Um, it's it's the air that we breathe. It's food. It's species. It's how it relates to nature and culture. It's how we build cities and integrate cities and and. And, you know, and, and as such, what I'm trying to allude to is it's, it's complex and therefore requires a multidisciplinary approach, um, even within the environmental discourse. You know, we need species conservationists speaking to city planners that are trying to, you know, uh, develop uh, in new cities. Um, when we think about biomimicry and how new cities can imitate nature and be much more sustainable. And so there's there's you know, the, the opportunities are great. And I think if this is the spirit that I think we need to convey because quite perhaps there are some who believe that being an environmentalist is limiting. Um, it's closing down certain opportunities. It's, chain, it's, it's stopping um, progress. 
but it's really the complete opposite. It's it's opening up the 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 light on on how we can progress, but differently, and how we can set up a a new narrative. And then going on to your second theme is again, unfortunately, for a very long time, the environmental movement has perhaps been a bit too exclusive, focusing either sometimes on the specialists, but also excluding women, excluding youth excluding the indigenous uh, peoples who are today recognized, all these three groups are recognized as really the key to addressing um, uh, conservation issues um, in, in, in the today and in the future. So it's really critical for institutions like the IUCN to genuinely and authentically, it's not a checklist, we need to certainly do that um, and recognize um, the impact that one can make when you are authentic about in, in inclusion. Um, and then I bring the, you know, the example from home. A lot of people, you know, ask me this question you know, as a woman from the Middle East, from a country like the Emirates. How did you progress? Uh, how did you develop a this 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 career? And it goes back to kind of policy. So it's, you know, whilst it's important that, you know, one have cert has certain beliefs and can be inspired, but you, know, you need to be able to advocate policy again to ensure that there is a level playing field in your community that everybody has access. And in, in the UAE, sort of the founding fathers, you know, and mothers of, of our nation, um, you know, work tirelessly and consistently for gender equity. So it doesn't happen, I think, by default. It needs to happen by design. So inclusion needs to happen by design in terms of designing the, the, the policies required to ensure that you are including the, the, the groups that indeed needed to be in included. So again, I'll give you examples from, from the UAE. So in the UAE, because of, of this policy that has been advocated since the establishment of the country, Today, for example, um, women uh, account for more than half of UAE graduates in, in STEM, so science, technology, um, and uh, engineering and math. It's a, they account for half of the members of our sort of federal national council, which is similar to, I suppose, uh, the, a, a parliament. Mm -hmm. um, they compromise half they comprise of half of our cabinet. And according to the World Economic Forum, UAE ranks second in, in wage equity uh, between genders. So, so what I'm trying to say again, and I'll repeat, it's by design. By design. And yeah. we need to, you know, we need to be authentic about it. We need to be consistent and we need to just get it done. Right. That's um, remarkable. Um, and it's also inspiring that, you know, you can be at a place you know, any country can be at a place where there's near equity in, in pay and um, have such uh, great, you know, diversity of men and women um, in these positions of power. Because I think it is really important to have not only those perspectives, but other, you know, um, racial and ethnic and gender diversity in these thought processes, because, you know, we all approach things from our own experience. And thinking about things and challenges in different ways, especially when we're facing these global challenges that literally threaten the existence of humanity, much less the, the existence of nature, having every different possible um, brain power and thought processes trying to address these challenges, I think is really, really important. Okay. And I'm, I'm so glad that you're out there to inspire more um, more people of color and more women to to get engaged and to really, you know, show that you can be at the top of of this field um, as a as a young person and uh, as as a woman and as a person not from sort of the, the the traditional countries that are in in these international organization leadership positions. Thank you. No, thank you. And it takes it, like with everything, it takes it takes a village. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, we all need to kind of, um, you know, lend a hand. Um, men and women in conservation organization need to continue to bring people into into this in, in, in into the sphere. Yeah. And like I said, make sure that it's not an exclusive um, club. 
and really breathe hope into it because I think that's also really important because hope is attractive you know you, once you have hope you're able to kind of attract people to to your movement and I think nature conservation is hopeful you know you talk to conservationists that have used data from nature serve and the, they'll tell you conservation works yeah and when you collect all these conservation stories from around the world, it's it's remarkable. And so I think it's really important that, you know, we remain hopeful, we remain optimistic, optimistic to be able to attract people into, into our field as well. Yeah, that, that hope is actually one of the things that's really, really interesting. I'm getting to spend a lot of time out in the field with different um, botanists and zoologists looking at uh, endangered species here in the United States right now. And it can be sort of overwhelming to be in the yeah. presence of so many endangered species, but the people that are working with them, like you said, they're very hopeful and they're like, well, you know, we've got this population here and we've been able to establish this preserve or we've been able to establish these policies to protect it. And therefore, this species can persist into the future. And it really is um, lovely to be around people who are so optimistic about the future when they also know very deeply what the challenges are. Yeah. And that's going back to IUCN and why I ran for president is because IUCN, you know, is a collection of all these incredible institutions and, you know, and civil society uh, members from around the world that are engaged in change in their own community. And so what's also really critical is when we talk about these big global challenges that we recognize that to actually make an impact, we need to go back to uh, supporting and empowering those individuals that you were referring to and those institutions to actually get the work done yeah. um it's important um that that these that we have a mechanism and i think you know when you talk about our goals uh, for the future we need an iucn that is empowered by its members but in turn empowers its own members to work um for example you know with the convention of biodiversity and reinvent and reimagine what it's going to take to protect nature we need to go big, we need to go at scale, we need to seize, like you said in your question, seize this moment, um, but definitely um, um, uh, go fast as well. Yes. Uh, so I have one last question that I want to ask you. So you're president of ICN and you've talked about your goals in that role, but that's not a lifetime appointment. And you will have a career and many more things to accomplish after that. And so I'm interested in sort of your goals for your personal legacy in working on environmental causes. Like when you're, you know, when people look back and they say, wow, Roseanne Al-Mubarak, she really, she hit, I was going to make a baseball analogy, but I don't know if that's very useful no, it, in, it, in an international. I said in I'm okay. a Red Sox fan. So I'm, okay. I'm, I'm good. Great. She she really hit the grand slam on <laughs> on her work. <laughs> you know what I found personally is is I I feel at peace because I think my professional and personal goals are quite aligned, and it is about living in harmony with nature because I think everything then stems out of that. So, you know, when we live in, in harmony with nature, when we breathe clean air, we're, we're healthier and happier people. And when we're healthier and happier people, we're able to contribute more. So, you know, sorry, I don't know if I'm, you know, if, if, if I hit a, you know, a home run with this answer. But, uh, but, but really, the, uh, the, the essence of what I'm saying is um, I think I'm lucky because my personal goals are very much aligned with my professional goals. Yeah, which is love, which is a wonderful opportunity, and I yeah feel feel similarly. Um, well, I hope I talk to you many times between now and then, but in another forty two years, we can uh, get together and look back at, at legacy and uh, see how see how that all went. Absolutely, thank you, Sean, for having me on Nature Serve and uh, for um, for for this wonderful conversation. Look forward to many many more. Yes, thank you, and also. Um, you mentioned earlier about the United Arab Emirates, where I've never been, so I hope to come visit. 
and uh, experience some of the nature there because I think it will be really, really exciting and obviously very different from what I'm used to here at home. Great. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Bye.